In today's video, we're taking the Tandy Model 100 online with a solution that costs less than $10 to implement. And we'll do a hack that'll take it to the big screen for some 24-line BBS fun. Anyone who's frequented this channel over the past few months probably has a pretty good sense for how much I really enjoy these TRS-80 Tandy Model 100 laptops. Now, I do enjoy other vintage machines as well, but something about the Model 100 just really sits with me. I think it has a ton of potential to do some really interesting things. Now, one of its best features was its built-in 300 baud modem. When you're at home, you could plug in a cable to connect the Model 100 directly to your phone line. And that enabled you to dial into your office to send or receive files. And if you were on the road, you could place a handset into the acoustic coupler. These are for use in computer-to-computer -computer communication in situations where the phone does not have a modular cord, such as pay telephone or hotel room telephones. One of the more interesting services at the time was the CompuServe Information Service. Now, as you can see from this 1984 Model 100 book, it could be used for home shopping, looking up the weather, and it even had an online encyclopedia. But the days of dial-up services over the phone line is long gone now. So to connect the Tandy Model 100 to the internet, a different interface is needed. And fortunately, the built-in RS-232C serial capability fits that need well. RS-232 is a standard that defines how data can be transferred serially between systems. Having been around since the 60s, it's actually quite old. Now, there are a couple different ways to use it, but the most simple is called a three-wire configuration. Here you have one wire dedicated to sending data, another wire dedicated to receiving data, and a third wire that's connected to ground. As long as the baud rate is set to the same value by both the sender and the receiver, this simple setup can be used quite easily to exchange data between two systems. But you can't connect a serial cable to the internet. RS-232 just pushes bits across a wire. It doesn't understand any of the networking technology to route packets and all the other important tasks that make the internet work. So we need a sort of translator that can convert the serial data to modern networking protocols and vice versa. And for that, we can use an inexpensive microcontroller based on the ESP8266 chip. Now, first and foremost, the ESP8266 is primarily a Wi-Fi chip. However, it also has an SOC, which adds a native TCP IP stack on top of it. And for the interface, it uses a serial connection with, believe it or not, standard Hayes modem commands. Yeah, this is super interesting. If you use these Hayes compatible modems back in the 80s and 90s, this will for sure give you a bit of nostalgia. But it gets even better, because the SOC can also function as a general purpose microcontroller. And it can even be programmed using the Arduino IDE. Because of this, we've seen some open source projects that make the ESP8266 do some interesting things. And in particular, we're going to look at one of them called ZimModem. ZimModem has some really interesting features, and I'm going to take a look at a few of those in a future video. But for today, I'm using ZimModem as that translator between the Model 100's serial connection and the internet. The Model 100 will send serial data to the ESP8266 running ZimModem, and that will in turn send that data out to the internet address that we want to access. Okay, let's set it up. The first thing you'll need is an ESP8266 development board. Now, one nice thing about the ESP platform is that these are very inexpensive and haven't really suffered from the chip shortages, so they're easy to get your hands on. Now, the board I'm using is called the ESP12E, and you can get these from Amazon for about $3 each. Once you have your ESP dev board, 
you need to get Zen Modem running on it. So that needs to be downloaded from the GitHub repository. And you need the Arduino IDE to flash it, which I already have downloaded and installed. Now, before connecting the ESP to your computer, you need to install the VCP driver. The board I'm using uses the SI Labs CP2102 chip as a USB to UART bridge. This chip shows up as a USB device on your computer so it can talk to the ESP's serial interface. After the driver is installed, the ESP dev board can be connected to the PC. Then load up the Zimbodem sketch in the Arduino IDE. Once inside Arduino, the ESP board libraries need to be installed. So go into the Arduino preferences dialog and add the following board manager URL. Then search for ESP from the board manager interface and install version 2.7.4 of the libraries. Then in Arduino, choose the ESP12E board, set the correct port, choose 115200 as the baud rate, and select how much of the flash you want to use for the file system. Finally, you should be able to click the upload button in Arduino and Zimmodem will be flashed onto the ESP dev board. When that's done, you can then open up the serial monitor and connect at 1200 baud. You should be greeted with a welcome string and the word initialized to indicate that Zimmodem hasn't yet been configured. Next, the Wi-Fi connection needs to be set up. This is done by typing the command at plus config to activate Zimmodem's configuration interface. You'll be greeted with a menu of options. Type Wi-Fi and then walk through the prompts to get up and running on your Wi-Fi network. The last thing I did for my setup was to lower the baud rate down to 600 bits per second. Now that's rather slow and the Model 100 is capable of higher baud rates over RS-232. However, I found that on my particular device, anything higher than 600 baud would start skipping data. Okay, well that's it. The ESP dev board is ready to go. So now you just need to connect it to the RS-232 port on your Model 100. But not so fast. The voltages used by the Model 100's RS-232 port range from negative five volts to positive five volts. And the ESP's serial pins all operate on 3.3 volts. So if you plug your Model 100 into the ESP directly, you'll probably damage the board. To solve this problem, we need a level shifter to get the voltages from the RS-232 connector into the zero to 3.3 volt range. And we need to get the TTL voltages from the ESP device over to the negative five to positive five volt range for the RS-232 interface on the Model 100. Now, the easiest way to do this is to use an RS-232 to TTL converter. This one has a MAX3232 chip on board, which is made specifically for this purpose. And these boards are less than $2 each from Amazon. To use it, connect the ground, transmit, and receive pins on the ESP to the pin header on the converter board. Also, connect the VCC pin to one of the 3.3 volt pins on the ESP. This will supply power to the MAX3232 chip. And then you connect your Model 100 to the converter. Normally, you would need to use a null modem cable, so the transmit and receive lines are crossed. However, I noticed that the converter already crosses those lines. So I had to make an adapter to uncross the lines in my own null modem cable. And of course, make sure the ESP dev board is plugged into a USB power source. Okay, so then to use it, you need to open the Telcom program and type stat 48N1D and then push the term button. The laptop should now be connected to the ESP device. To verify, you can type in AT and hit enter. And if your connection's working, the ESP will respond with OK. All right, let's connect to a BBS and read the latest news headlines. To do that, you enter ATDT and the address of the BBS. 
In this case, I'm going to connect to the Retro Campus BBS, which is specifically made for retro computers to connect to. You notice that when I connect, it allows me to choose a device profile which defines the size of the screen. Now for the Model 100, you'll want to choose option 0. It says it's for the Olivetti M10, but the M10 is basically the same system as the Model 100. When it draws the menu screen, you'll see that it scrolls the display, and because of that we've lost some of the earlier text. The Model 100 keeps the previous screen cached in RAM, so all you have to do is press the F1 button, and this effectively lets you have a 16-row display on your M100, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's look at some retro news headlines. And as you can see, this is very usable. And yes, it is a bit of a surreal feeling reading current news articles on a laptop from 1983. The experience here is actually really good with the Retro Campus BBS, and that's because it was designed with the limitations of these older devices in mind. Now this isn't the case with all BBSs though. So let's connect to a different BBS and see how the Model 100 handles that one. This time, we're going to connect to the Cave BBS. Everything comes through and it's somewhat readable, but we could definitely benefit from a larger screen. Now, in a previous video, I showed you how to hook up the Model 100 to an external monitor by using the MVT100 adapter. And that would be the ideal solution here. However, the MVT100 uses the RS-232 port, which we need for the Wi-Fi modem. So to work around that, I'm going to show you the BCR hack. What this will do is enable you to use the barcode reader port as a serial interface. Now, the BCR port already has pin 2 set up as a serial receiver line. So what this mod does is it connects pin 3 to a transmission signal. And it's a pretty simple mod. It only requires that you add one wire to your Model 100. Okay, well, as usual, the first thing to do is to open it up. And you can actually do this mod without even having to remove the board from the case. We just need to solder one end of a wire to pin 12 of this chip here, which is M34. And the other end needs to connect to pin 3 of the barcode reader port. Alright, that's it. So I'm just going to go ahead and close it back up. Okay, let's try it out now. I have my MBT100 board here. And one of the cool things about this mod is that 5 volts is present on pin 9 of the BCR port, so we can actually swap this jumper here, which tells the MVT100 that it'll be powered over the serial port directly. Another bonus is that the male DE9 connector on the MVT100 can now just be plugged directly into the BCR port, so there's no need for an adapter. But before it'll work, we need to adjust a couple of settings on the MVT100. So we'll plug in a PS2 keyboard. And hit Shift plus F12 to get into the MVT100 configuration menu. You can see here that we have the baud rate configured as 19,200. The BCR port actually supports a 57,600 bit baud rate. So we'll need to change it to that value. And I also had the data inverted previously, so we'll need to change that back to normal. Okay, now we need to load up the VT100 driver. I walked through that process in a video dedicated to the MVT100. So check out that video if you want to see how it's done. And with the driver loaded, we can now switch screens. To use the VGA connection over the BCR port, we need to switch to screen number 2. And we do this by dropping into BASIC and typing screen 2. And if it worked, we should then see the BASIC prompt on the monitor. Okay, now we can just press F8 to go back in the menu, and then enter back into Telcom. And now you can see we're using the Telcom app from the external monitor. Okay, let's connect back up to the cave and see if it's any better. Now, when I was a kid, I primarily played two BBS games, Legend of the Red Dragon and The Pit. 
and the cave has both of them, so we've got to try them both out. Let's take a look at Legend of the Red Dragon. This was a text-based adventure game that would interact with other people on the BBS. So it was a small-scale multiplayer experience. And as expected, it plays pretty well on the Model 100. Okay, let's try out a game of the pit. And you'll notice that it just doesn't render well. Now this game is using ANSI characters, which the Model 100 doesn't support. In fact, many modern BBSs rely on the ANSI character set. So you might have to spend some time trying out different BBSs before you find some that'll work well with your Model 100. The solution I walked you through here today is something I just breadboarded out to prototype for this video just to kind of show how it works. Now there is a ton of room for improvement. I could see myself revisiting this topic in a future video and maybe you know, building a PCB that gets embedded into the Model 100 and maybe even activating a couple of other interesting features. Well, there's a lot more I could cover on this topic, but I think I'm gonna stop here for today. Hey, thanks for going on this journey with me to get the Tandy Model 100 online. If you made it this far, then you might enjoy some of my other Tandy Model 100 videos, so check that out as well as some of the other videos on this channel. Hey, I'll see you next time, but until then, as always, go make something cool.